All right. So welcome everyone again to our customer insights webinar. Uh, today we we have uh, Dennis and Robert with us today. They will be presenting to you case Dengbom. Uh, I'm your host. Uh, my name is Maya, and I'm the marketing communication manager at Solibri. Uh, today, uh, I will let you know that uh, if you have any questions at any time, uh, even if it's a very solibri um, dedicated question, so you can send it in the chat. And if we don't answer it online, I will be sending you the answer privately to your email. I have your email, so uh, that should be uh, that should not be a problem. So uh, today, let's see the agenda. We will we have with us Dennis and uh, Robert, and they will introduce themselves um, uh, after uh, I uh, I introduce you to the agenda. So we will start with a short holistic perspective of digital transformation according to Tengbom, and we will talk about the importance of BIM execution plan with the with Robert and Solibri process and future development. After we finish presenting, they will, there will be some time for your questions. So please drop the questions at any time and we will address them at the end of the uh, presentation. So without further ado, I will give Dennis a stage. Uh, sorry, before before we do that, sorry, just a second. So um, we haven't done that in uh, previous uh, webinars, but I wanted you to uh, have more engagement in this webinar. And uh, so I'll be asking you some questions and to get to know you better and provide you with better experience. Uh, so the first question is, what is your field of expertise in the construction project? So I will give you a couple of seconds uh, to answer. And once we have most of our attendees answered, so we can show you the results. And I see now that uh, uh, more than 60% voted and it looks like mostly uh, we have the BIM consultants joining us and our architectures. So that's amazing. We have also engineer, engineers and um, in the construction. That's that's amazing. Great. Welcome all. Uh, let's move on to the other questions. So. We would like to know also what is the authoring tool that you're using? Oh, okay. We have now a lot of Revit users. Okay, more than 70% voted. Let me show you the answers. Okay, so with more than 50% uh, Revit users, that's interesting. Uh, okay, and the most important question <laughs> for today is how often do you use Solibri? We would like to provide you with the best experience today. So let us know what is your level of usage. Okay. Uh huh. So there's once or twice a week, once or twice a day. Okay. So very little that never use them or doesn't don't use them very often, as you can see now. Okay. So we have a lot of weekly users. Welcome. Okay. So thank you all for participating and. Uh, Let's move on with the presentation. I'll give the stage to Dennis.
Yes, thank you. Let's see now. There we go. So Robert, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, I can start since you're going to continue to talk. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Robert Larnestov. Uh, I'm the structural engineer and uh, office manager of digital methods at Tengboom uh, in Gothenburg. Um, I've been working with BIM during the last 14 years, uh, but since 2016, I started more work as a BIM specialist, and since around 2019 and 2020, I started as, uh, more as a BIM coordinator, coordinator in more, more projects. So it's a uh, small info about, about me. Yes, and my name is Dennis Olofsson, and I'm a civil engineer in architecture and also an office manager of di digital methods at Tengbom at the office of Karlstad, which is in Sweden. So let's get started with the presentation for today. Um, but firstly, let's see. Tengboom, who are we? Actually, we're one of the oldest architectural firms in Sweden, and it all started back in 1906 by a Swedish architect named Ivar Tengboom, who has designed multiple famous buildings around the country and whom laid the foundation of what we are today. And that is a growing company of around 500 employees with diverse competence and various knowledge regarding modern architecture in practice. And we operate in all of Sweden, as well as in Finland at our Helsinki office. And represented today is the offices from Gothenburg and Karlstad. But in general, we all work as one. And we do this wherever the possibilities exist. With anything related to architecture, interior design, landscape, urban planning, and much more. And therefore, we have been involved in a lot of different projects where some is at a very large scale, and others at the much smaller scale, adapted to the local conditions. Sustainable development projects is also very important for us as we believe in a better future. And this could also enable new interest, interesting architecture where intersections of the old and new is allowed. We also believe in a collaborative building process where we as architects help the decision making from the beginning to the end. Sorry, some, <laughs> I think I got a little lagger in my computer. One sec. There we go. Um, because we want to make architecture a good deal for everyone involved. And we do this by utilizing architecture to its full potential both in the shape of a physical product, as well as in service or process, where continuous curiosity and development help us push boundaries for the future. And one way of doing this is by leveraging digital transformation. And this is why me and Robert are here today as ambassadors of this ongoing transformation. And it's our mission to guide and assist in both the larger questions as well as the smaller ones regarding digital transformation within Tengbom. And that is what I'm going to be focusing on today in my part of this talk before giving the word over to Robert, who will show some examples of how we utilize Solibri as part of our digital toolset. 
So the big question, how do we at Tengboom work with digital transformation in the field of architectural practice? Of course, digital transformation has been going on for a while. It's nothing brand new. The shift into digital tools such as computer-aided design and later BIM has given us an incredible foundation to build upon. But what is the next step and what new tools and technology are we looking into today? And that is very relevant questions as new tools and technology help us achieve what was not possible before. And today we see a lot of new digital tools emerging, helping us as architects to design better buildings. And in general, we are quite good at adapting this new kind of technology by a lot of skillful individuals pushing this development within the organization. So utilizing new technology is not really always the biggest obstacle when it comes to digital transformation for us today. The trickier part is to integrate these emerging technologies into the already ongoing processes and projects of a fully operative organization, while also doing this in a way that creates real value for the architectural process as a whole. And that is an overall process which is far from simple, with multiple stakeholders involved and with a not so linear approach of solving problems. And this creates certain demands on how we utilize these new tools and possibilities if we want to create real value in both the process of creating architecture as well as the physical end result. And therefore, new methods of working needs to support, support the creative side of architecture as well as the iterative approach of solving problems to be really relevant for us. And that is what we are looking for today. Because if we just continue to add new tools without considering how these tools work together or support the iterative nature of design, this tends to create a way too slow and complex method of using in real practice. And when this happens, our digital transformation moves into a direction which we do not want to. It's slowing us down. What we want to achieve instead is the sensation of acceleration, not the opposite. And in order to do so, we first need to understand what benefits a more digitalized workflow could generate for the architecture as a whole, both in the process of creating architecture as well as the physical end result. And secondly, we focus on how to make this possible without creating interruptions or slowdowns while also considering all the different ongoing processes and the iterative approach of solving problems. And at this stage, we start to see the real benefits of what digital transformation should be, where the new digital tools and technology create synergies in a larger context. And this is what we try to achieve and what we are mostly focusing on today. So even though digital transformation is always going to be a lot about adapting new tools and technology, the biggest challenge for us is to combine these new possibilities with our already ongoing processes in a way that creates synergies for the process as a whole and without losing our creative momentum. And this concerns both the usage of new technology as well as understanding the very basic daily work that exist in most of our projects. And as an example of this, if we look into how things used to be done before considering this, we would see a lot of ongoing processes driven by different competence, developing more sophisticated methods of working with the new tools and technology. But the thing about all these different processes is that they used to be somewhat parallel which, we, which means they were not really utilizing the work of each other. Rather, they were going into more different directions and even more so, the more specialized these would become. And maybe this was a phenomenon in the early stage of the digitalization. 
but slowly the creative process of architecture started to lose its momentum by working this way. And this happened because the new tools being adapted by us were not really operating together in a smart way that could leverage each other's work. And therefore, this was creating a very slow and complex method of working. And at this point, we, we started to question if we are really working in the right way with the new digital tools and technology. But still, we did not want to limit the curiosity and competence of those pushing the boundaries of what architecture could be in the future. We just needed to spend some more time thinking about how these new tools and possibilities could benefit the architectural process as a whole, and how these new tools would support the iterative approach of solving problems together. And for us at Tainboom, this turned into an active function of understanding our own architectural process and every code process contributing to this larger context. And basically, this is what me and Robert are doing within Teng Boom as managers of digital transformation. We spend time thinking, thinking about how to optimize our own digitalized workflow and how to make different processes more compatible with each other and ultimately how to create synergies for the whole architectural process using new digital tools and technology in a smarter way. And when we started working in this way, with the larger context in mind and the process as a whole, things started to get really interesting. Parallel processes started to overlap and benefit from each other, making the whole process more unified creating synergies between them. And this also supported more effective design iterations while still utilizing the more sophisticated methods of working with new digital tools, making overall better design. And sometimes new possibilities would emerge from the interaction between these different processes where the mix of different competence together was creating a whole new way of working. And that is where we are at right now, adapting new tools and technology, then trying to combine these with our ongoing processes to create synergies for the whole architectural process. But there is still a lot of work to be done, considering the whole building process. Regardless how much we dig digitalize our own architectural practice, it is still a collaborative business of multiple stakeholders and disciplines working together. And the possibilities as a whole is therefore somewhat limited. Um, and the active work we do internally also has to be done outside of our own business as architects if we want to further transform the whole building process. And that kind of leads us towards the area of beam coordination, which is a common process in most of the building projects of today and where tools such as Solubri and open formats such as IFC help us collaborate in a more unified way. But we believe there is still a lot of work to be done in this area to create more synergies between different disciplines enabling smarter and collaborative ways of working and also more sophisticated methods of doing so. And that is why we want to openly discuss how we do our work as well as how other disciplines do their work. Because by understanding the overall process, we can digitally transform even more of the whole building process. Yes, and that concludes this first part of how we at Tainboom look at digital transformation and what we want to achieve by working this way. And now we'll move on to Robert, who will share his method of working with Solibri. All right, thank you, Dennis. Uh, now I hope you can see my screen. Uh, yeah, it looks like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I will continue. Um, yes, I will talk about the process of 3D coordination here at Tengboom. And I saw during the poll that uh, there's a lot of architects and BIM consultants uh, here, but there's also from this different other disciplines and uh, I think that's really great because that's the purpose of the uh, collaboration during the coordination. Uh, my, me, myself, I'm a, mainly a Revit user, uh, which I saw most of you are as well, and you and that you use it weekly, uh, solidly. Uh, so I will try not to focus too much on details uh, because I think you are quite familiar to Solidly in that way. But all right, let's start. But before uh, before we start heading into Solidly, I want to make a quick stop at the BIM execution plan. Uh, this document is essential to the 3D coordination when it comes to pull all disciplines in the same direction. Within the BIM execution plan, there are a few things that I think is important to mention. Object naming, uh, it's a way to structure objects in models. And this is important because it creates a common base for all objects. But how the objects are named depends on the project and if it if it will be integrated into, say, a facility system. Uh, data management is required of requirements of which data that should be included in the IFC. This is often common in projects where data is going to be implemented in a facility system. I don't know if all of you are familiar with the EFC, I guess, but it should for those of you who aren't, it's, it stands for industry foundation classes. It's an open mutual file format and a standard developed by BuildingSmart. Uh, this we use uh, to help us. Uh, this is used to help different BIM programs uh, within a project to export the same structure. It's shortly about EC. Property sets, or as we say short, shortly, P set, is a way to collect data in group. Uh, the use, usage varies between different projects. Uh, one project may only use predefined P sets from different systems. Meanwhile, another project defines its own P set. Uh, delimitation between disciplines. Uh, this has always been a common part of every project when speaking about responsibility. This can also be applied to the model itself. For example, take a load-bearing wall. If the EFC model from the structural engineer contains the wall and any hole, for example, windows and doors, the windows and doors instead comes from the architect model. Right, that's about the BIM execution plan. So let's head into Solibri. Uh, and in this webinar, I will use uh, Solibri Office. Uh, and these are the stops I will do during the process. Uh, merge and check models. Uh, this is actually a step I used to do early in a project as I control that all models are has implemented the correct coordinates. Most of the time we use a local base point, but sometimes in larger projects we use uh, area base point instead. So I will have my solidly here. And I have my files over here. And I open them. You see when they come into the model. Usually it goes quite quick. And 
the first thing that's happening, as you know, you have this uh, dialogue about uh, the models that are implemented. Uh, I will. As I usually assign them in, with a short name and put the correct discipline. Uh, the discipline is necessary in order to perform an accurate model check. Uh, short name, on the other hand, is not necessary, but I think it's nice to do it. Uh, and now this, the letters I will put in is for the Swedish business. Uh, so I will just add that in here. And I will just check the discipline. We have the electrical, and here is the structural, and I have the ventilation, and I have the plumbing. Right. And when that's done, I check the role. Uh, oh, it's too soon. I have it here. Sorry. Here is roles. And this what I will take care of later. Uh, when I do the uh, beam coordination, uh, I use a specific role in, here in Swedish. This is a role named beam uh, coordination. And the role uh, contains preset rule sets and classifications, uh, which I need during the control. Uh, the rule sets and classification is the thing that's being checked during the collision control. And by using this uh, with all its presets, it's actually a good way to structure and automate the collision control. I don't have to put all the rule sets and classification every time I need to do a collision control. And now I'm going to update the classifications. And you saw this yellow post-it before, it's a to-do list. And here it solubly wants me to verify classification of load-bearing objects. So I just heading into it. And here I have different uh, elements. I have the flooring, I have the beams, columns and walls. And here, Solibri wants me to say which is load bearing and which element that isn't. And I think this is correct. So I just press OK and I can turn this off. So when I'm done all the presets uh, and all the settings, I'm ready for the first part of the collision control. Uh, and it's where I let the computer analyze the model according, according to the rule sets and classifications, as you saw before. Uh, and when I'm done, I will press the bottom of check model. But like chefs on TV, I already prepared the result because it will take some time. And I will have that here. So this check result and presentation. Uh, the second part of the collision control is made manually and it's where I basically check the result. Uh, so if I go to checking, now we can see that there is a lot of issues. Uh, it solubly divided into three different issues. I have uh, issues with critical severity and I have issues with moderate severity and with low severity. Uh, the goal is to go through all these to have them either rejected and or accepted. Uh, of course, if everyone is accepted, I will be happy, but that's most not the case. Uh, so what will I do? Yeah, okay. So for, uh, let's say that I go into uh, collisions between installation and 
and constructions. Uh, I will do, I have a critical here. I go in here and open this up and I can see, okay, I think this, maybe, where is it? Yeah, I have a collision here and I can zoom in like this and I can see, all right, it's a clean collision. Um, I will turn everything on, try to zoom it, uh, like this, like that, and I can add some uh, markup. I want to put a good view and I maybe just easy put an arrow. And then when I'm satisfied with this, I will create a slide where I say, okay, it's a collision between root structure and I think it's ventilation. And then I continue, since I made it uh, a slide, this get automatically rejected, which I want. Uh, I leave the status open because this is for the 3D coordination meeting, but I use, use the responsibility and labels. And in this case, I put K, it's structure for construction in, in Swedish, and I use E for ventilation. And I can see the picture here. And then I turn it down and I continue. And I go through all the issues. Of course, I won't do it in this webinar uh, because it takes a lot of time. Uh, as you can see in this particular model, we have quite a lot of issues that go through, but most of these aren't really issues. Uh, but I, some tips I want to share of a good collision control is to create an understanding for how other discipline models behaves. For example, as I mentioned before, which collision that are actual collisions. Uh, for example, um, the pipe consultant sometimes use like bendable plastic pipes uh, that are put in the floor uh, but since they are bendable uh, they are not really collisions so to say uh, that's just one example uh, another tip is to be curious and ask questions when you don't understand and the last tips i have is to rather add a collision if you are uncertain than miss something important there, as you saw before, going through all these issues, it takes a lot of time. But the amount of time that you put in this phase depends on mainly two things in my experience. It, the firstly, it's in what extent the different consultants coordinate themselves before the collision control, meaning that they implement other EFC models from other disciplines uh, in the models, and therefore they may be able to adapt and solve problems while working in their own model. Uh, secondly, if the consultant performs an internal collision control and avoids unnecessary collisions, such as double objects in the same place or adding a pipe that cuts another pipe, if we rule these issues out, the list of issues will be smaller and therefore both collision control and 3D coordination meeting will uh, decrease in time. Uh, so when all the collision has been reviewed and all, and all collisions that need to be addressed is, are marked, uh, it's time for, to create a presentation. And then I move to the communication and this 
I have prepared another model for. Let's see, it's here. Uh, this. So in the communication tab, I just add a new presentation. And for example, I call it English. Control one, and here is where I connected to uh, the issues which I've been uh, going through in the last stage. Uh, when, when I choose this from checking result, and now you can see here is the responsibility I added. I have the construction and ventilation. I have from the electrical. I have uh, the installation, the collisions, uh, like this. And if I enter one of these, let's say I take this one, you can see that here is the description which I have before. Uh, it's open, so when I uh, this is open and you can see the, the responsibility and you can see the picture. All right, let's move down to the next phase and it's uh, the 3D coordination meeting. And during the 3D coordination meeting, we address all the issues and assign them to responsible discipline. Uh, so if I go back to the model uh, at Solibri again, uh, in this phase, I use this dialogue most of the times and this one. So let's say during the 3D coordination meeting, we address this issue and we say that, okay, uh, this needs to be fixed. Okay, we have the ventilation consult fixed, or we say it needs to move the pipe and then I will put the status to a sign and then I do this for all the issues until every issue has been handled. Uh, another thing that's also uh, good to do is to open the model okay, let's see if I can go out of the building again it's to, during the meeting, create a, a visual control of areas that we're during the project um, being identified as critical. So in that case, maybe we want to just step into the building, uh, do this little game, uh, walk around, and I can well, let's say, let's go down to the storage room and we know that these uh, ventilation pipes and insulations are quite critical because we need to secure that they can be installed in this way. So then we can go down here and we can talk. And if we identify another issue, I can go back to the communication tab and I can create a new issue where we stand and I can uh, yeah, put something to uh, collision B and uh, we can put like a sign and I put the B and I put some text that we inspect this solution in the model. Uh, and by that I can create a quick issue uh, dependent to this uh, visual control. Uh, I actually, this part of the uh, 3D coordination, I, I actually think is the best part uh, of the process because it's where the dialogue between different disciplines improves the whole project and it, it often it's its uh, participants. 
And as I said before, the more that's been done before the collision control or the treaty coordination meeting, the shorter issue list and the shorter handling. Uh, all right, let's move to the to the next communication. So when the treaty coordination is finished, I usually sum all remaining issues and export them in requested format. Most of the time I'm, I export them as a PDF or an and Excel format, but the goal is actually to export them into BCF format. I won't, won't dig deeper into the BCF format today, because some of you are probably already familiar to it, but roughly it's a, it's a format that enables sharing of issues to BIM program, often through um, adding directly in the program itself. So Revit has one, ArchiCAD has one, uh, I think Tecla has one. Uh, it's a very nice uh, add-in actually. And last step is, <clears throat> It's the follow-up and collision control. And in this step, uh, it's time to replace the old models with the new ones. And this is done in order to control that the issues from previous collision control has been handled. From here, the process may continue to several possible paths, depending on the project and its requirements. Uh, today, I roughly divide them into four different paths. The first path is I create a new collision control and if most issues from previous control are handled and mine or non-new issues has been added from the new models, the process is concluded. The, the second path is that I create a new collision control, but if a lot of issues from previous control remains and or several new issues has been added in the new models uh, that we need to be addressed, uh, the process restarts. And I do another collision control. Uh, the third path uh, is when the projects, some projects are scheduled for several collision control. So in this case, the process already restarts and it's planned to restart. The last and fourth path, uh, then nothing is done after this collision control. And this is actually the worst path, path uh, when it comes to quality control, but yet it still happens sometimes. And here also the process is concluded. And Lastly, I want to talk about the next step for us at Tengbo. Uh, the process of 3D coordination is always under development and there is always improvements to do. Some of these improvements we want to achieve uh, are these. Create and edit rule sets. Uh, the role we use today is provided by our Solibri distributor, but we are working in a business that are under development. And soon we want to be able to create and edit our own rule sets to fit requirements within our projects. Uh, BCF Manager, as I mentioned before, we want to move more into using this program or add-in which will make it easier to identify issues directly within the model. This is also a way to improve uh, the quality control of our projects by ruling out some of the human factors. Uh, the program has been around for some time, but in my experience, most projects isn't really ready for it yet. Uh, create P sets, so property sets, this is also a way to meet the business development in the same way as I mentioned uh, about the rule sets. Uh, so I'm going to dig more into it. Uh, 
And another thing that we've been looking at is to implement Solubly early in our process. Uh, I mentioned before that doing in internal collision control reduces the time of the external collision control, which I showed, showed you today, uh, but also th the 3D coordination meeting. Not only that, the possibility to enter a model that contains all disciplines to visually review it and see how all the objects, objects are connected is a huge advantage, uh, at least for us to understand it. Uh, yeah. And that will be all from us. Um, there are, are, of course, a lot of more things to say about this subject, uh, but time's is soon, time is soon up. Uh, I hope you, there is something that you can bring back from our presentation. And I will, me and Dennis will thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert and Dennis. Uh, this was, a very thorough uh, explanation of Solibri um, process in Thingbond. So let's thank you so much for that. Um, let me, uh, le uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, send us to send it to the chat and the question section, and we will address it. We've already. Um, received some questions uh mainly for you robert so how much time do you typically spend completing the first collision uh, well that's all that's always the question and that's sorry that's, the rest of the question was the first collision on on this sample building yes uh, Okay, on the first collision on this sample building. Okay, um, the, the sample building was, as you could see, a, a, a house. Uh, uh, I don't remember the word, but you can see that it was a. Uh, all right, um, and that's. I think that's that's the big question, uh, which I mainly have to focus on when getting assignments from from our customers because it depends on as i said before uh, how many issues there are uh, doing a collision control where that have a lot of, of uh, issues that's going to take a lot of time to to go through uh, but i think between the around like uh, eight to 12 hours, I would say, mainly uh, is uh, yeah, main, most of the times around that. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, I've assigned some of the questions, but I will be reading them out loud. So, um, how can we sort the results of the collision test, for example, lev level wise or responsibility wise, etc.? If the, if I understand the uh, question correctly, is uh, in the communication tab, and uh, I can. Let's see if I can uh, just, can I take the, the screen for a sec? Oh, Maya? yes, sure. I will send it to you, Robert. I will see that it's this one. And let's see, do you see my view? Yes, you do. I, I think mm -hmm. it's about this. Uh, and as I said before, when I do the sorting, uh, I put in this responsibility and labels, and I have all the different disciplines within the projects, and that, that's why I, like, as you can see, in this case, it's only for the ventilation consultant, in this case, it's for the architect, 
construction and ventilation. And in order to do that, uh, insolubly, you need to have that in, in the first row uh, beside the flag. So if I want to, for example, sort by, by from 1 to 55, I think, I put the number here in the first row. But if I want to sort for responsibilities, uh, I put that in the first row, the column, I mean. Uh, and then also I can say, okay, I forgot to, maybe this one, uh, it's to, uh, it's A and K, uh, A and, sorry, B in this case, and I can sort that as well. So that's how I use to sort all the issues. So I can take all the questions for the electrical engineer at the same time, for example. I hope that was the, the answer for your questions. Thank you. Uh, anyhow, if we didn't address all the questions, I will be sending it uh, privately to our attend uh, the askers email. So don't worry about that. Just ask the question in the chat and we will get back to it. Um, here's one question. Um, have you did you define certain rule sets to be run at specific project phases? Typically, the needs at, in the beginning of the project are uh, the needs in the beginning of the project are quite different to those at the end. Um, no, we have, and that's what I talk about the, the development here at Tingle. That's where we want to get, but we need to learn how to create the rule sets. I'm still, uh, I've been using it for, I don't know, five, six years, but not into that area. So that's what we need to, to uh, develop. So no, in this, yes. Okay. That's good to, to address um, this, um, this point. So, so that that's what we talked about in the development phase. So, um, and, and mm -hmm. I also want to add that most of our development is also connected to the business. Sometimes we don't need to do it and therefore we haven't developed it yet, but we know that we need to. So it's, it's a balance also. Exactly, exactly. Um, we have one question about, uh, do you do any da data uh, validation? Uh, no, we don't. And this is also connected to the development because I think that's also uh, connected to the rule sets and classification, so it's a development thing for us. Okay, um, some are asking about the recording of the webinar. I will be sending you an email after the webinar ends, uh, hopefully today, and it will include the link to the recording of the webinar in case you missed it. Um, Okay, here's also another question about how do you deal with the elements that create multiple collisions by one element? For example, a duct elbow uh, created minimal three different collisions with a beam, etc. And I guess that question was, was for me as well. Um, what I didn't really, I didn't went really into the details, even though it was quite detailed, I realized, but um, you can always put several issues in the same slide uh, and the slide will be connected to these issues. So you don't have to do like a single slide for each issue. So you can also add several of slides into uh, one issue at the same time to really pinpoint where the issue is. So then there you have to try it yourself, but uh, you can by pressing it, for example, controlling, you can press several issues and then you can put a slide to it and it's connected. That's how I used to do it.
Mm. Okay, I see here another question. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'm trying to, now we're receiving a lot of questions, so I'm trying to read and choose questions at the same time. Uh, what kind of CDE are you using in BIM projects? I think it's mostly for Robert. Or um, frankly, I'm I'm quite. Um, I don't really know what CDE is. <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so please, please uh, uh, identify the question more. Um, I'm not going to mention the asker, so please. So it's common data environment. What kind of common uh, data environment you are using in BIM projects, like BIM uh, 360? All right. Um, now, like BIM 360. I think most like uh, we use another program for pollution control in BIM 360, um, but um, mainly ah um, yeah I, I actually I, I don't really I'm so unfamiliar to this uh, expression or this. Uh, so I have to think about it and, and maybe I can write the answer instead so I completely understand it. Okay, um, what about uh, what file format is required as input file? To Solibri? Um, yes. Well, most of the times, uh, as I mentioned before, we use the IFC. Uh, and in a lot of projects, I collide different uh, EFC into one big file, but then it's SMC instead, uh, because it's a file format file solid. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, if your question was not answered, I will send you an answer after we finish um, the webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis and Robert. This was really great uh, presentation. Um, and thank you all who have joined us today. Um, I'm sorry, we, we ran out of time uh, to answer all of the questions, but, uh, but I will get back to you. Um, you've been amazing Dennis and Robert and uh, I've been receiving a lot of uh, thank you uh, emails at the same time so thank you so much um, thank you all to our attendees and I hope to see you very soon with another customer insights webinar